Hey everybody, welcome back to English 116. This is for our class for Monday, the 9th of September, where I wanted to introduce the idea of literature and film. And you can see that in the notes below, and I'll always have notes below our videos, that our previous classes are in the folder above entitled past class sessions. So I would have retired last week into that folder, and I will do that at the ending of each week. I will retire that week into that folder so that you have the current week easily visible on your Moodle page. And I wanted to talk first a little bit about plagiarism. When you're using somebody else's language or ideas and you're not acknowledging the source. And I have a section on the syllabus about plagiarism. And it's basically intellectual theft, taking somebody else's work without giving them the proper acknowledgement. And it's pretty serious. It can result in failure for the assignment if, if you're found plagiarizing or even an expulsion from school school with a notation indicating that you were ex expelled because of plagiarizing. And what I used to do is I used to tell two brief stories to try to encourage people not to plagiarize. One happened to me very early on in my career, pre-internet. So that meant that I couldn't go onto the internet to search for the source, which you probably know that as many sources that exist to help students plagiarize, there are an equal number of sources to help teachers find plagiarists. So um, something like turnitin.com is one of those sources or one of those sites where I could plug in, let's say a sentence or a paragraph and do a database search and find information about plagiarism and perhaps the original source. Um, but that didn't, um, that didn't exist when I was reading a paper that sounded familiar. I had to rely on my memory in the early days of my career. And it occurred to me very quickly that um, what I was reading was a passage from the class textbook that I had assigned. And that ultimately, um, there were even a few mechanical errors in there, whether it was because the student was a sloppy plagiarist or whether it was because they were hopeful that I would in, in one way or another be fooled because there were some mechanical errors and think that was their original work. The better story happened around the same time, but not to me middle-aged professor and that part is important a middle-aged professor and um, he also was not able to rely on the internet to do a database search and he's reading papers and he realizes that he comes across a paper that sounds familiar and also realizes that it sounds familiar not because he has read it before it's because he wrote it himself decades earlier when he was an undergraduate student, believe it or not. It has something to do with the fraternity that was reselling papers. And um, this appeared, this story, in all the academic newspapers. There is such a thing as an academic newspaper. And, and then that would pretty much uh, be my little plagiarism speech. As you know, things have changed dramatically in the last year or two with artificial intelligence. And this is my um, request plea, demand, I don't know what, what language to use for you not to use artificial intelligence, at least in this class. Not against artificial intelligence, but I do have some concerns. Um, there is a, a great story about how, oh, there are multiple great stories about artificial intelligence giving incorrect information. Um, one of those was with an attorney actually who was using chat GBT to come up with court cases of precedent. And he asked chat GBT if these cases were valid and real and was assured that they were. Then the judge, when the judge did some old fashioned investigation with paper and books, found out that all of these were fictional. So um, I've heard lots of explanations as to why ChatGBT might be giving incorrect information, um, including the word that's been used, hallucination, that ChatGBT and other artificial intelligence programs might have the ability to hallucinate. And that said, that, that worries me because ultimately that implies some sort of self-awareness. If you are a Terminator movie fan, you know how badly things go when um, technology and machines have become self-aware. Um, 
I, I also think about the ethics of chat GPT and about how, if, for instance, artists are not being compensated for their work um, and what this means when um, artificial intelligence programs use their work and, and build upon it. Um, I, I also wonder about the moral and, and ethical implications of something that has been so rapid um, and, and, and human history we're used to change occurring over years, sometimes decades, not over days or weeks. And, and what does this mean for us um, from a, an economic perspective, for instance, and complete industries perhaps being reworked um, or perhaps even collapsing? What does this mean for us psychologically and being able to keep up with this rapidity? Um, I think about all of these things and also just the old teacher idea of wanting to teach students how to learn and not necessarily have to rely on a machine. And those are all of the reasons why I asked you not to use artificial intelligence or to plagiarize. And I've deliberately included assessments in this class for you to be successful. I know that's one of the reasons why students use artificial intelligence and outside resources because they want to earn a good grade. Well, answering the discussion forum questions will help you earn a good grade. Your first paper was a critical paper, not a research paper, because I don't want you to use outside Side resources. I want you to use your brain and what you've learned. That said, you can rewrite it for a higher grade. Um, your second paper, if you can submit it in early enough, you can rewrite it. And your final examination is open book, open notes. So I'm hopeful that all of these elements will come together so that you aren't tempted to plagiarize or utilize something like artificial intelligence, at least in this class. So that's my little plagiarism speech. I wanted to talk a little bit about some foundational readings from the textbook to help prepare us to read literature. Now that said, I know that this is a tricky time in the semester because students are adding and dropping. You may not necessarily have had an opportunity to get a hold of a textbook, though there is a copy of the text on reserve in the GCC library. And I had also indicated that I will, whenever possible, provide you with free links of the readings that we're doing. So unfortunately, there are no free links for these these initial readings, or at least none that I've been able to find. So if you do find a link that is for free, please let me know so I can share that with everybody. Because these initial readings are basically the editor's um, reflections and instructions on, on what is literature and how to read and how to go about writing it. I see this as kind of our introductory week before we get into the literature itself. The first set of readings was a section entitled Reading Imaginative Literature. And that, you know, in the broadest sense of the term, I guess literature is the written word, anything that's written down. But when you talk about the kind of literature that we study in school, we're not just talking about, let's say, an instruction manual, which could be seen as a kind of literature, or a magazine article, which could also be seen as a kind of literature. What we're talking about is fiction and storytelling. And we'll see that literature doesn't really lend itself to a, a neat and tidy definition. Um, but some of the things that it does do, this kind of storytelling, is that it should broaden our perspectives on the world. It should hopefully attempt to entertain. It may not necessarily entertain you personally, but there would be an attempt. It oftentimes provides social commentary. So it's doing more than just storytelling. And it uses language in interesting ways, in different ways. So there is an essay from the New York Times that I've included below, um, and it's entitled Your Brain on Fiction. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the pieces of this essay, which I think is fascinating because it talks a little bit about how science has tried to investigate what happens when we read literature. And what they did was they examined brain scans. 
um, of individuals as they were reading detailed descriptions or metaphors, comparison of two dissimilar things, or an emotional exchange between characters. And what they found is that certain areas of the brain are stimulated that are reflections of what it is that we're reading. And we the things that we're reading can even change the way we act in life. So certainly we expect that classical language regions are going to be activated when we read. However, they found that other areas, they being scientists, other areas of the brain are also activated, which is why that feeling of reading can sometimes feel so alive that you can even forget that you're reading. So words like lavender and cinnamon and soap elicit a response, not just from the language processing center, which we would expect, but also those areas of the brain that are devoted to scent. And there are lots of studies that have shown this, um, one being in 2006 from Spain. And in fact, the studies are global, which is nice. Um, it isn't just from the United States. Participants from this particular study were asked to read words with strong odor associations, along with neutral words, and then their brains were scanned with an MRI machine. So when they looked at Spanish words, because of course this was a, a study that was done in Spain, for perfume and coffee, the area of the brain associated with um, scent so, um, was activated. But when the words of chair and key were read, that area of the brain that's associated with scent was not activated. Um, this also occurred with metaphors, again, comparing two dissimilar things. Um, so saying something like a rough day um, should be tr so familiar to us that they're treated as words and nothing more. Um, so, but when you read a metaphor that involves a sensory element to it, that involves texture, the area of the brain associated with touch is activated. Things like the singer had a velvet voice or he had leathery hands. Um, roused the area of the brain associated with um, senses, uh, with, with sensory um, elements, as opposed to similar um, phrases like the singer had a pleasing voice and he had strong hands, didn't activate those areas of the brain. And that um, the same thing happened with words describing motion. This was found um, in a study with France as um, participants were reading sentences like John grasped the object or Pablo kicked the ball, um, that there was more activity in the motor cortex, which coordinates body movements. Um, even more interestingly, perhaps, is that the area of the brain that was uh, associated with a, a particular body part of movement that was being read would be activated. So if the movement described was arm related, well, then that area of the brain associated with the arm would be activated. So that seems to suggest that there really isn't much a distinction between reading about an experience and encountering it in real life, at least according to the way the brain responds, which means that this is probably the closest we can get to experiencing um, an, a, a particular situation or a particular emotion without actually living it as, uh, ourselves. Think about what this means in terms of our understanding of different peoples and different times. This is the closest we're going to get to being able to experience it ourselves. And that fiction gives this great replica um, that allows us something that also is unavailable off the page. We can enter fully into other people's thoughts and other people's feelings. So novels or short stories or dramas or even poems are all ways in which we can do that. And we can hone our social skills through reading. Um, another study, this was done in Canada, that there is substantial overlap in the brain networks used to understand stories and the networks used to navigate inter interactions with other individuals. Um, especially when we're trying to figure out the thoughts and feelings of others. This is called the, um, um, call this capacity of the brain, the theory of the mind. And narratives, stories, fiction, literature, um, give us a unique opportunity to do that. Um, and 
one last study I wanted to talk about, and this was um, done to try to see if reading literature allowed the reader to empathize more with other individuals. Um, the relationship, it seems that um, from reading persisted um, even after um, the reading was done and even after researchers accounted for the possibility that more empathetic individuals might prefer reading in the first place. So it seems that reading increases our empathy for other individuals. Um, what all of this means is that there are many benefits associated with reading. It allows us to hone our social skills and it allows us to experience that which we cannot experience in our real life. So I always like to start the semester by talking about that article as the foundation for why we're reading literature. Again, not just the written word, but pieces of fiction that are associated with, in effect, storytelling. And all stories are based on reality in, in some fashion or another. And that said, usually there is a, a ranking or a hierarchy that there are some stories that are considered to be more reader worthy than others, more academic than others, uh, better written than others. And those decisions are usually made by scholars and critics and teachers who study literature. And they come up with those works. It's known as the canon, C-A-N-O-N. And you can see that in the notes below under the first section. Those works considered by scholars and critics and teachers to be considered to be the most important read and study. But of course, these individuals are um, biased and these individuals change over time. Um, interestingly, a text that you might have heard of that's considered part of the canon, Moby Dick, it wasn't initially considered to be a great piece of literature. It was considered to be a study of whales. And it was only years later when individuals revisited it that they found it to be one of these pieces of literature that was worth academic study. So now it's become almost universally known as a great piece of literature, even though most people haven't read it. They just know that they've been told this by others. Um, and, you know, ultimately the critics themselves illustrate their biases. So when we had mostly male critics, well, then their biases were towards mostly male authors. And of course, as our um, society has changed to have uh, voices of the uh, disenfranchised and the oppressed, then we have more works from disenfranchised and oppressed authors that are included with debates going on. On, of course, you know, because you can't read everything or you can try to read everything. But I, I think that it's an impossibility. And most students would say that they certainly don't want to try to read everything. So do you stick with the classics? You know, those works that have an established tradition. Usually they've stood the test of time, which means that the authors are dead, um, if nothing else. Or do you listen to these more contemporary voices or voices that have been excluded in the past because of political reasons or social reasons or economic reasons or gender issues or any of a number of other issues? And usually what you've got are reading lists and literature classes that try to balance the two. Some of those classics, those well-known names that have become almost you know, part of popular culture because they're so well-known, the Shakespeare's, if you will. Um, along with some lesser known names. And the second set of readings that I had assigned, um, there it's entitled Critical Strategies for Reading. And it's a dense reading, um, but it gives you an idea of how these scholars and critics go about make reading a uh, profession. That's usually the biggest difference actually between college teachers and university teachers um, in that College professors um, usually focus on teaching and then scholarship and research secondarily. University professors is the exact opposite, is they focus on scholarship and research first, and then teaching is secondary. And for those individuals who've made um, scholarship um, their career, they've come up with different specializations and ways to read and interpret literature, almost like any discipline or any profession like law or medicine. And 
that set of readings that I had assigned, and this is in the second section of the notes below, critical strategies for reading, talk about some of the ways that, that this has evolved over time. And it really started with the formalists in the 1800, where they would look at the formal elements of the work. Hence, they were known as formalists. They would look at the language of the work. They would look at the structure of the work. They would look at the tone of the work. And then around the 1940s to the 1960s, and I don't think it was a coincidence that the job market became much more difficult in the 40s and 60s for professors. There were a group that came out called the New Critics because they were just that. They were um, critics who were doing something that was new or different. It's an unfortunate term because as time passes, they're no longer really new critics. But at any rate, their focus was on close reading of the text, while the formalists had assumed that you need to have a certain prior knowledge in order to be able to interpret literature. That's not what the new critics thought. Anybody could read at any point in their reading career. Um, obviously, the more you've read and um, the more experience you've had with literature, the, the more sophisticated your analysis could be. But anybody could read, let's say, a poem. As long as they could read, it could be a first grade student or it could be a graduate student. Obviously, the graduate student is going to be able to get more out of that poem than the first grade student. But in that close reading, you look at anything and everything that sort of jumps out at you. So that's usually what's done in junior high school and high school classrooms and college classrooms, too, where you're looking at things like diction, how the language is put together. You're looking at things like irony, things that are unexpected that come with a kind of twist. And, and um, a, a great example of that is perhaps a firehouse burning down. That would be a great example of irony, something that would be unexpected that has a kind of twist. Um, paradox, two seemingly contradictory terms that in reality support one another. Symbolism. Uh, literature is oftentimes about representation, that you have something that's literal, but it symbolizes or represents something else. And think about how often we use symbolism in our own society, um, oftentimes for things that are not concrete. So you think about patriotism, you know, that's an emotion. It's not something you can touch or feel. But a flag is something you could touch or feel. So the flag is the symbol for patriotism, for instance. Metaphor, also comparing two dissimilar things um, that don't seem to have a relationship with one another, but ultimately can be shown to have a relationship. Plot, you know, this is the most surface level, what's happening. It's, it's what I call the junior high school book report. Um, without plot, you can't do any of the other elements, but you, you need to be able to understand plot. But plot is the least of it when we're thinking about all of the other elements, such as characterization or narration, who's telling the story. Much like when you are interacting with somebody who is giving you the information is going to influence how you respond to that information. So you need to pay attention to the narration, who is telling you the story. And then there were a whole host of critics that basically specialized further, biographical critics, and luckily the terms oftentimes give you an idea of their focus. They focused on the biography of the author's life, that the authors were really writing reflections of their own life, which is probably true, but also is limiting because ultimately this is fiction. So it's just because somebody's writing about something, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've experienced it themselves. Um, psychological critics, focusing on the mental state of either the characters themselves, so you could play kind of psychologist and try to analyze the characters, or the author and try to understand the psychological state of the author and how that's reflected in the author's work, or the psychological state of the reader and the, how that influences how a reader responds. Historical critics, they looked at history, past events, you know, understanding the time period that a work was written, which we'll talk about. It's very important to know what time and place we're in when a work was written, because it was written for that time. That's not to say that there aren't parallels with contemporary times, but obviously it is a reflection of its time. 
new historic critics. So they were looking at history, but a different kind of history, not just necessarily dates or, or political events, but culture. You know, and in the broadest sense of the word, culture is a, a, a group of individuals who share commonalities, uh, behaviors, beliefs, attitudes, ultimately values. You know, um, and think about things like popular culture can, uh, you know, that which is consumed by the masses. You know, we think about our media forms like um, a streaming for instance, um, films, uh, television. I teach a class actually in, in popular culture. How does all of that um, play a role in the way that we interpret literature? Or how about gender critics where you could focus on the female and you could be a feminist critic, or you could focus on male, or you can focus on non-binary. Um, Mythological critics, these old traditional legendary stories that are told generation after generation, culture from culture. Reader response critics. So this is an interesting one because the focus is less on the author and more on the reader. How does the reader interpret the work? Not just an individual reader, but how do groups of readers interpret a work? And if groups of readers are interpreting a work in a particular way and they can defend that with using evidence from the text, well then it doesn't even matter what the author's intent is. It all falls back on evidence from the text. Um, many times English majors go to law school and become attorneys. That, that was basically my initial plan when I was in school. Because what you learn to do is to find pieces of evidence in a text and put that together much like you would if you were an attorney putting together a court case. And a good attorney can take either position innocent or guilty, defense or prosecution. Of course, the evidence might weigh more heavily on one side or another, but a good attorney can find those pieces of evidence that would make their case the strongest. And that's basically what it is that you're doing when you are a reader response critic. And um, you're focusing on how groups of readers are finding evidence to support a particular position. Or deconstructionist critics. This is also quite interesting. You know the word deconstruction, to take apart. The, yes, it's true, whenever we read literature, we take it apart. But deconstructionist critics are deliberately taking apart literature to find contradiction. And the argument is that everything is contradictory so that it basically cancels itself out. Uh, the text implodes upon itself is one way to think of it um, because of all of the contradiction. It's actually a philosophical argument. And notice how many of these ways to interpret literature are based on the idea of uh, interdisciplinary studies. But deconstructionist critics, this philosophical idea that everything basically collapses upon itself because of contradiction, was an idea that was applied to literature. The um, origin of this was a philosophical critic uh, French by the name of Jacques Derrida, who was very complex, very difficult to understand. And at the height of its popularity, deconstructionism, this would have been in the 1980s, was drawing standing room only crowds of some of the greatest scholars and critics who freely admitted that they didn't understand it. And I wonder if that's the reason why they found it to be so appealing. Um, that said, I, I think the problem with deconstruction outside of the fact that, well, it's not terribly interesting to find uh, contradiction and negation so that there is no meaning in effect, um, was the idea of the contradiction of there is meaning in the argument that there is no meaning. Now, Jacques Derrida said that that was just merely reaffirming um, his argument, but many people saw it as a kind of scam, if you will. So deconstruction has become a lot less interesting. And I, I tell you all of this not because I expect you to find a particular um, way to read a piece of literature so that you declare that you are, for instance, a Marxist critic. Marxist critics would focus on socioeconomics, on money, and how that... Um, role plays uh, in terms of our interpreting literature. Um, I, I wouldn't limit myself that way. Instead, what, what I suggest you do is that you take bits and pieces of all of these approaches and apply them to the texts as it is um, necessary. Um, so some texts lend themselves more to a particular lens than others. I think that's a much 
better way of approaching literature than declaring yourself um, from a particular school, let's say a reader response critic. So you're going to read everything from that particular lens. So the third section that I had assigned for you to read was about reading fiction. And this is about careful, deliberate reading. And I recommend three readings. The first reading just for plot. The second reading for interpretation, what's happening, uh, how can it be analyzed? And the third reading to refresh your memory before you're going to talk about or write about it. Now, I know these are a lot of readings that you may not necessarily have the time for. And this is basically our homework, if you will, um, basically reading as much of um, as much as it is um, writing. In fact, there's a lot more reading than there is writing in this particular class. But this careful, deliberate reading, which requires not only rereading, but annotating, writing in the text, taking notes, even journaling about what it is that you're reading and the questions that you have and the observations you make. What you will soon notice is that many of the pieces of literature and fiction that we'll be reading, there are questions at the ending of the text. Those are things you might want to consider, whether you write about them or just contemplate them in your mind. I, of course, in these class videos, will also be talking about some of those questions and elements for you to consider about the reading. Um, in the section that I had given you for reading fiction, they give you an example of annotation. That's not the only way that you can annotate, but if you wanted to see a student who went through and actually took notes with a text, actually a text that we will be revisiting, story of an hour. And you'll also see an example of a student who wrote a detailed journal. There is no way, one right or wrong way to write a journal. Um, the idea of a journal is that it's much like a diary, that you are, are basically just taking your own notes. You know, it, it doesn't have to make sense to anybody but you. It doesn't have to be mechanically correct. But that basically the act of writing about what you are experiencing can be very helpful to you. So all of this idea of reading carefully can also be applied to film. And while we don't read a film per se, we watch a film. I would say watching film from an academic perspective, more than just watching it for entertainment, requires the same level of um, of, of uh, seriousness and the, the same level of um, focus. And in fact, I had um, a handout that I wanted to reference. I've put this in our syllabus and other documents folder. If we were meeting in a face-to-face -face class, I would distribute this handout now. And it's about how to read a film. And that movies and literature, they both utilize storytelling, but movies have pictures to tell the story. After all, we say we watch movies. We don't say we hear movies, we watch movies. It's about the pictures. And literature, words tell the story. Um, and keep in mind, in the early days of film, we had non-talkies. You know, that it was only afterwards that we were able to add audio to film. So we indeed watch film. Um, and probably we've watched a lot more films than we've read books. So um, studying it from an academic perspective, I think is particularly important because of the time and effort that we've probably put into film in the past. Um, film is the only literary form where the text actually moves. And it also has a sense of permanence. Unlike drama, if you were watching something on a stage, once it happens, it's gone. But the idea of something that's written or a film is that you could go back and rewatch. And as technology has advanced so that we can watch films in our homes, we can rewatch, we can fast forward, rewind, stream. This really gives us the opportunity to watch a film very carefully in the way that we, I am suggesting would read very carefully. Um, and remember, we talk about films as being motion pictures. Um, they show us things. Sometimes they tell us things, but more often than not, they show us, which is what literature aspires to do. It's to show, not to tell. And if something is shown in a film, it's probably important. Just like if something is mentioned in a piece of literature, it's probably important. Now, there are some directors and some films that will deliberately try to, um, 
misguide. Um, think about Alfred Hitchcock. He utilized a technique called the MacGuffin. It was a direct, deliberate misdirection. So showing us something that we think is going to be important, and then it turns out to be not important at all. But more often than not, if a piece of film shows us something, it's important. And if a piece of literature mentions something, it's important or else it wouldn't have been addressed. Film images offer lots of suggestions, extended meanings. So just like we were talking about symbolism in, um, in, in the written word, images can be symbolic as well, much like that flag that I was referencing earlier. And when we're watching film, we have to remember that it is the camera that's giving us the image. We see what the director and the camera operator want us to see. The director is the one who's primarily responsible for the film. You think about today's day where we deify directors, people like Spielberg. Um, the actor usually isn't responsible for the film. Um, usually the actor does what he or she is told by the director. Um, maybe that's why so many actors want to be directors. I'm not sure. Um, unlike drama, when we are watching something on stage and we can decide where to direct our attention, the camera selects for us where we're directing our attention. Um, and of course, now that we have the ability to rewatch a film over and over again, we can analyze film in the way that we would analyze, in effect, literature. And just like literature, film can be classified by a genre or kind of category. Um, what is different, however, about film from literature is that it's not necessarily easy to show the mental state in, of a character in film, unlike literature, where you could read a character's inner thoughts and inner dialogue. In a film, we have to see it, though sometimes we could have something like a voiceover in a film where we are hearing the character's thoughts. Um, and we do talk about movies being magic, you know, that there is a, an element of illusion with them. Um, this is oftentimes related to special effects. The best illusions, as we will discuss, are invisible. Um, and Citizen Kane is a great example of this when we watch Citizen Kane. Expect three acts in a movie, just like in many ways you can expect a, a beginning, a middle, and an end for every story. But the first act in a movie, about the first 30 minutes or so, is when you get introduced to a character. The second act, the next 30 to 60 minutes, is where you see some sort of conflict. And literature has to have conflict as well as film. Something has to happen of interest. And then in act three of the film, perhaps the last 30 minutes, there's some sort of resolution. That doesn't mean it's a happy resolution, but there's some sort of resolution to the story. So some language that's associated with film. A frame is a single shot because films are basically just pictures that happen to be shown very, very quickly, specifically 24 frames per second. And each shot should tell a story. And then scenes are a series of frames that these 24 frames that tell a story. And then sequence are multiple scenes that tell a story. So you've got a frame as a single shot, 24 frames per second. Then you've got scenes that are series of frames and then you've got sequences that are multiple scenes. So some things to consider when you are watching film, the choreography, the movement, this is all very, very um, deliberate, where people stand, how they move, where they move. The cinematography, the actual filming, the sound, the audio. And if you are a film buff, you probably recognize these categories because they oftentimes are um, given awards like the Academy Awards. Think about how the scene is framed, how the camera shows or doesn't show certain elements in a scene. Think about the way that something is edited, how it's cut. Um, how do you move from one image to another? Do you fade? Do you dissolve? All of these things are important in terms of the filming. The camera angles, again, a camera angle can very much influence how we go about interpreting something. The lighting, um, the distance, usually we get medium shots. They provide the most information, but we can have close-ups where you're focusing on an element or a long shot where it's too fo far to focus on any particular element. The term dollying means running the camera back and forth. 
on a dolly, in effect. Zooming, when you're going closer or farther away. Panning is a stationary camera that moves from side to side. Of course, when we talk about sound and film, we're talking about more than just the dialogue. We're talking about sound effects and musical score. And the film stock itself, color versus black and white. And obviously in the beginning of film, we didn't have much of a choice. Um, now black and white suggests distance or, or nostalgia or can set a, a mood or a tone. Um, so that handout, I, I always suggest that everything in the syllabus and other documents folder that you print out because it's good to have a paper copy. But that handout also works with the elements that I talked about in terms of the text about how to read and how to write about literature. Um, what we are going to be talking about next class and this is when we start to actually transition into watching film and reading literature. Um, we are going to be talking about writing about fiction. We are going to be talking about writing about film. I'll have another handout for you. Um, we are going to be talking about the writing process. And skim means just that skim, glossary of literary terms, that there is a glossary of literary terms in the back of your book that I wanted you to know that were, were there. And then we can begin with the film Citizen Kane. This is a wonderful time to get ahead with the readings um, and that we are going to watch Citizen Kane over several classes. And I will be providing links for you to be able to do that. And what's left is basically our attendance question for today. And of course, we'll also be talking about our first paper as the semester progresses. So the attendance question, which would be due on Wednesday at 9-11. And again, if you need additional time, please ask me for an extension. What do you think makes a piece of literature or film worthy of being included in the canon? Those works considered by scholars and critics worthy of study. And why? And notice that there are no right or wrong answers to this question. I'm really more interested in your reasoning. As I indicated, you don't have to respond to your peers, but you do need to read your peers' responses and my responses in turn. That would give you an idea of what it is that we would be talking about in a class discussion. So basically, the only thing that's left, I think, is to draw your attention to a little cartoon that I had included in the notes below about banned books where there's a table of um, an individual giving out sheets of a list of banned books and the person who takes the sheet ends up to be a teacher who is basically using that list for the year's reading list. I think that says a lot about the kinds of literature that we'll be reading over the course of the semester, that some of it would be considered to be controversial in nature for a whole host of reasons. Um, banned books probably go back as, as long as, as writing has begun, but certainly they've come to the forefront over the last several years. And I am a firm believer that nothing should be banned. It should be read. You, you don't need to agree with what it is that you're reading, but you should have the ability to be exposed to it. So with that said, again, our attendance question is, what do you think? make something worthy of being studied in an academic context. I hope you are doing well. I am doing well, and we will continue on next class. Take care. Bye-bye.